Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke. It follows right on the heels of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this particular section where it is, uh, if you ever get to travel to Israel, you can see where the Sermon on the Mount was supposedly given. You can go to that site. And the city that Jesus did most of his ministry in on the Sea of Galilee is a very short walk. So you can walk directly from one area to the other, and it's right on the Sea of Galilee. And that is what we suspect Jesus was doing this particular day. He had gone from the Sermon on the Mount directly to Capernaum. So I pick up there in the 7th chapter, verses 1 through 10. After Jesus had finished all of His sayings in the hearings of the people, He entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom He highly valued and who was ill and close to death. When he'd heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he has loved our people, and he has built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And one says, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turned to the crowd that followed him, and he said, I tell you, Not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto You. Amen. Jesus marveled. The word that's used there in the Greek is this idea that Jesus was, uh, we translate it here in the New Revised Standard Version, as amazed, but marveled. It's a word that's used within the Scripture in multiple other places of the New Testament, most often used where Jesus had just done a miracle, He had done a sign or wonder, and then all of a sudden all of the people looked and they marveled at what Jesus had done. They were amazed. Now, when I read Scripture and I see a place where God is amazed, I take notice. Uh, Does this sound like the thing to do? I look at this and God, Jesus, was amazed at what had happened. It's an extraordinary Scripture. And it was also very interesting this past week reading multiple different commentaries on this. It's interesting because the really liberal section of the church on their, uh, on their section of commentaries really don't know what to do with this Scripture. Uh, it's problematic in some ways. Uh, we have a soldier, uh, which often isn't liked by the very liberal side of the church, uh, who has a slave who is healed but not set free. Uh, the very conservative side of the church has some problems with this. Because we don't know if the man who is the soldier ever becomes a follower of Jesus. We're not sure how Jesus did the healing. Does it say how he did it? All we know is is Jesus is amazed and then he's healed. Uh, There is a lot in this scripture that we import with our own mind and we look at it. But I think that what the real point of much of this section being told here has to do with this. That Jesus is amazed. Jesus is amazed at the faith of this centurion. A centurion is a soldier who is in charge of, uh, anybody want to guess? How many people? A hundred, yes, a century. Yeah, you guys are sharp. You you catch right on. So he's in charge of a hundred soldiers, and that's what he does, and so he has people working for him, and he looks at the world through the lens of what he does every day through his job. He imports how he interacts and does things from his worldview. We all do it, we just don't often realize it. 
When I first received my calling uh, to go into full-time ministry, I felt like, okay, God, I, I made this deal with God. If you open the doors, I'll walk through them. Watch out for that deal. Watch out for that deal. If you open the doors, then I'll walk through them. So at that point in time, I felt called, and, and I looked, and I go, well, I think I'll go to Asbury Seminary because my friends recommend it. And I looked at the requirements for being admitted, and I did not meet them. Uh, having been in the job I was in, I was able to read standards, and what are the standards, and where was I, and we don't need to go over the specifics. But So I filled out the paperwork, I sent it all in, and then I received a phone call very shortly after they had received it all. Apparently there was a mistake in my paperwork. I had not uh, apparently filled it out or transposed some number. They asked if I went to some college, and I'm like, I hadn't even been in that state. And so we got it straightened out, and then they were about to hang up, and I'm like, well, when will I know if I've been accepted? And, and the young lady on the phone said, oh, you've already been accepted. You can go ahead and go online and sign up for classes. And I was like, great. Great. Okay, so I, I go online, and this is the way it is in college. If it's been a while for some of y'all, or if you've never been, if you sign up late, your choices for classes might be narrowed down <laughs> just a little bit. So I'm going through like the online full, 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 full. Oh, here's one that's available. Philosophy of religion. Now, mind you, I have never had a philosophy class. I'd never had a religion class. And I'd never taken an online class. So I thought, well, God, you opened a door and this is the class that's available. I signed up. And then I find out it's an adjunct professor in Oxford, England that I am taking this class from. Now, a, a little bit of humor for the boy from Conroe taking philosophy of religion from Oxford, England. I felt like I'd been thrown in the deep end of the pool. Now, since then, I've met Tim Allen, who apparently, he's a pastor here. He went to Oxford, England for a semester, so apparently it's not that big of a deal. So... <laughs> For those of you who know Tim Allen, y'all can talk to him about that later. Just thought I'd throw him under that bus. <laughs> like y'all don't think that yourselves. So I'd signed up for the class, and I had to write a paper on what is it to have knowledge and what is it to have faith. Well, I, I was a person who was going, well, I'm sure I'm supposed to write this from a biblical perspective and all these you know, thoughts and things I'm supposed to write. And then it occurred to me, I did what the Roman soldier did. I just imported my world into the question and answered it. I answered the question from my worldview, which was I had been a banker. What was it to be a banker? And what's the difference between having knowledge and having faith? Now, I will tell you this, many people who are senior executives in banking do not like to talk about us having faith. They prefer, can y'all guess which one? Knowledge. Uh, now, to explain lending to you, and this is something they never want to talk about, is you are paid back a loan with cash. Okay, I know this is stunning stuff, but you lend people cash, and they pay you back in cash, and they pay you back in cash from future available cash flow that they have. And you predict their future available cash flow, are, are you ready for the leap in logic? From their historical available cash flow. Do you, can you see what can go wrong with this? Right? You are predicting the future from looking out your rearview mirror. It's like driving your car and driving with your rearview mirror. You get the idea? There, there's a problem. And so there is an amount of faith that is required. And in fact, in all of life, we have faith. We, we do all of our life by faith. Many things, we live by it. We drive by faith. Uh, you come up to a stop sign. Do you know everybody who comes to the other? Well, you might in Crockett, but right? Do you know all the other people that come to stop signs? Do you know they're going to stop? It, it reminds me this fellow is visiting from out of town, and he was getting driven around. And the local guys, he drove him. He he drove through a red light, and he says, "You know, my brother does that." And he drove through a right a second red light, and he says, "You know, my brother does that." And then he comes up to a green line, and he's coming to a stop. And he says, why are you stopping at a green line? He goes, well, my brother might be coming. So <laughs> we, we live by 
faith, but we don't often realize it. We prefer knowledge, but we, we interchange the two. So in, in banking, if you want to go out of business, you can not do any loans because you require perfect information. You require perfect knowledge, which of course you will never obtain, and you won't do any deals. Or you can have faith in everybody and lend everybody money. Uh, do you all see where that would go? And, and not get paid back. And then what happens? Of course, you go out of business that way. So there is in life a place where there is information, where you have knowledge, and with it you import faith. And the two work together hand in hand. So we have reasons for what we do. So I had written my paper to this professor at Oxford. He gave me an A on it. He thought this was kind of quite brilliant stuff. And I thought, well, you're in luck, buddy. I got more of this. <laughs> it's about all I got, but this, this is what I've got. So uh, after graduation, I went to Kingwood. And there I was called to work with men and to try to get men to engage in Bible study. So I thought, well, how do you attract a group of men? And I thought, I'm thinking meat. So we gave away a free barbecue dinner to invite people to uh, an event that would engage them to want to join a Bible study. So I, I unashamedly invited them. Have you ever been to one of those places where they sell you timeshares? That was my idea. So you're going to get something free, but you're going to get a sales pitch. And the second thing I thought is, is this was a place where we had a lot of businessmen to invite a businessman to come and speak about how faith and his time and his business all interacted. Uh, the name of this man was Mattress Mac. If you know Mattress Mac from Houston, he's got the big furniture store and he's always doing advertising and he is quite willing to come and do a talk if he can talk to people uh, he, he was really impressed when I said, I want you all to know this is an unashamed commercial. And he stood up right after me and he goes, you're my kind of guy. <laughs> you just have to see his commercials. So what was really interesting about his talk was it was a, no less than about a month after, do you all remember his business burning down? Uh, he had a large warehouse behind the front of his storefront and the entire thing had burned down very publicly uh, many fire engines were all there putting it out. So I asked him to come and speak about that event as well. Now, can you imagine how many people wanted to come hear this? We packed the place out. We had 250 men there. We had a bunch of them join Bible study afterwards. It was a wonderful event. But what was interesting is having him talk about faith. What was interesting about his point about faith, when he was asked about what faith was, he said, as the store is burning... His wife is on the phone ordering furniture. Now that's faith. They didn't know where they were going to put it. They didn't know if the insurance was going to pay. They didn't know if the rest of the store was going to burn down. They didn't have any ideas about all of that. But what did they have? They had faith in what they were about. So I think the question for the church and for all of us is, is the faith that we have in our everyday life and all the things that we do all the time, is that faith out there have anything to do with the faith that we have within God and the church? I'm not sure those two things often interact. Uh, the faith that we live by our businesses, our world, everything out there, do we allow it to cross over into the world that we live in within the church? And th that's a relevant question for us. Now, I, I turn back to my centurion friend, and, and I think about where he was. Because within the Scripture, it says something. He said he had reasons. I, th I think often most of us have reasons for the faith that we have. We have reasons for the way we live, for the way we do things. We had reasons in our banking world for why we lent on this and didn't do that because we had experience. And the centurion said what? He said, I had heard of you. I had reasons for what I invited you to do. I want to know who he heard it from. Did he, did he hear it from the religious teachers? Did he hear it from the slave? Did he hear it? Now, you have to envision Capernaum. I've been there. It's smaller than Crockett. So if there was Jesus walking around in Crockett, would you hear about it? 
I'm going with yes. We hear about not Jesus in Crockett. I'm thinking you might hear about Jesus. So uh, I'm sure he heard about it, and then he had reasons. Now, the word apolo- apologetics, which is a form of Christian defense, how we defend the Christian faith, apologio is the word for reasons. You see, we have the reasons for the faith we have. We don't have proof. We don't have absolute knowledge. But what do we have? We have reasons for our faith. So we have apologetics. So here we have our friend who invites Jesus because he has his reasons. He's heard it. It's a logical leap and he's able to do it. Now, And then I find the other thing that's interesting is our Jewish teacher friends, and they believe that Jesus owes this to him. Oh, you should do this because, did you catch why? Because he was a large giver and he paid for the church. Which is a pastor, I'm on board with him. You don't know that right now. In fact, there, there's another joke that goes along with this. There's two jokes in today's sermon, so I hope you're ready for number two. Uh, there were two very wealthy individuals and they were out fishing and they became uh, shipwrecked. And as they were sitting there lamenting what had gone on, one of the wealthy men looked at the other and he goes, well, I'm not real worried about it. He said, because I'm wealthy and I make a lot of money and I tithe to my church. So I know we're going to be saved. And the other man says, well, wow, that's a whole lot of faith in God. He goes, well, that's not who I got faith in. I know my pastor is going to come look at me after next week. So, (laughs) Right? That's the way of the world. The way of the world was what? You owe this to this individual because he is worthy. And what is his words to Jesus? I know that I am not worthy. The words of a holy person, I know that what? I am not worthy. And so in his not worthiness, he speaks to Jesus in a form of faith. I know that I am a man who is what? Under command. And I have people that listen to me, but he listens to people above him. And I know that you are a man in similar situation. I think one of the things we have to remember about faith is that the faith of a soldier is a pretty important faith. It's a Memorial Day weekend, and what many soldiers are called to do is have faith in their leadership. They have faith in their leadership. Why? That may not look like good orders when you're on the ground and you're asked to do something, but you have faith that the person above you has more vision and has what is best in their mind. So he has faith, what? That he is willing to give his life for the mission. It's no wonder that he has faith. And then why does he have faith? Because he has people underneath him who also work in the same way. And so he's used to people being able to take orders. And so in this way, he is able to bring faith to the table that he says, what, that I haven't even seen in Israel. Is is the people of God, are we used to people? Used to being those who listen to orders and take orders. Soldiers often go on exercise. They take practice so that they are willing and ready and able and physically fit. But within the church, do we have faith enough to study Scripture so that we're ready? I know that I have enough faith that when I'm hungry, I can go to the grocery store and they'll have groceries, right? I have faith enough to know that. Uh, I don't even call them in advance to make sure that they've got food because that would show that I needed some knowledge, right? If I called them, hey, you guys got food there? When I was in banking, if I was worried about a check, I would call and verify the check. But what do I do? I get in the car and I drive to the grocery store because I'm hungry and I need food. But as the church, do we wait until we're emaciated and hungry before we study the Scripture and God's Word? Or do we have faith that God already has something there for us? Or do we look for comfort in other people and other circumstances and other places? Or do we have faith that through prayer, God will provide comfort and solace to us? You see, the faith that we live out in the world every day is a type of faith that we often don't import into our spiritual lives. Knowing that God has something for us, but we have to be willing to show up to find it. Well, 
One, one final story here. A little bit, one of the reasons I really like this story, it's kind of one of my favorites because it is kind of messy and it doesn't fit in all the great categories. Uh, you just got to picture that about me. So, but One of the things that's funny is as you're going through the process of becoming an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, which takes quite a while, they interview you on a regular basis and they ask you lots of hard questions. And near the end, one of the questions they asked me because of the way our system is built is we are itinerant pastors. Itinerant pastors mean that we are sent. And the way we are sent is the bishop meets with the cabinet and then they decide where the churches we should go and then they make up their mind and they call us and then they say, will you go? And so they asked me this particular question when this whole process takes place, will you go when you are sent somewhere? The default answer is yes. Well, I, I was going to be quite clever and I was going to give them the lawyer answer because the lawyer answer is, well, it depends, right? It depends. It depends on a lot of things. Uh, but I believe that God can work within the bishop and the cabinet and that through these meetings and prayer, you'll come to the right answer. Can you see where this answer is going? And I get through with the whole answer and one of the guys who was wise and had been around a while, and he goes, look, if you get a call and they want you to go to Hearn, Texas, are you going? I said, yes. Do I have the faith of a soldier to go when I am sent? The question within each of us is, do we have the faith? Do we have the faith of a soldier that when God sends us, will we go? My prayer for this church, my prayer for you, is may you have the faith to say yes, and may Jesus marvel at your faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.